Welcome, everybody, to our exploration of the book of Job. This is going to be a great journey for all of us, and I hope we all enjoy it. We're at the start of a great journey, so a few general remarks might be useful. First of all, it is commonly recognised that the book of Job is part of world literature. It's on that level. And it contains some of the very best poetry in the Bible, as we shall see. At the heart of it, of course, it raises some very human, very essential questions. And a few of these are, can faith in God ever be disinterested? That's to say, without motive. Why do the innocent suffer? Is God really just? Is there a balance between what we do and what happens to us? As we go on, we shall see that Job explores human experience very deeply, very painfully. And Job asks all the right questions. And the final answer in the book is complex, quite different from the opening chapters and hard to track. So we're on a, on a journey and welcome. The opening presentation will be in three parts. First of all, a general word about the wisdom books, and then an overview of the book of Job, and then a close reading of Job 1 to 2 to get us started. Because the wisdom books belong to the ancient Near East, it's no harm to remind ourselves of the general picture. And the general picture is had in the left-hand column where we have the Bronze Age, Iron Age 1, Iron Age 2, the Persian period, the Hellenistic period, and the Roman period. The second column has approximate dates for those times. The third column gives the books and events in the Bible, and the fourth column gives the politics at the time. Now, in general, people regard the book of Job as coming from the Persian period. So the time around 538 to 323, the time of exile and return, the time of the Second Temple, the time of Cyrus the Great and Alexander the Great. It's no harm to ask uh, which books of the Bible are regarded as wisdom books. And actually there are two lists, depending on whether you read the Bible that was written in Hebrew or the Greek translation. And in the Hebrew Bible, the books are Proverbs, Koheleth, Job, the Song of Songs and some Psalms. In the Greek Bible, it's Proverbs and Koheleth, now called Ecclesiastes, the familiar title for us, Job, the Song of Songs, some Psalms, the Wisdom of Solomon, written in Greek, Sirach Ecclesiasticus, translated into Greek, and the novel, the Book of Tobit. And at the bottom are some of the typical Wisdom Psalms. And Wisdom literature in the Bible comes in two major forms. There's proverbial wisdom, usually two lines at a time in parallel. This tractate wisdom, that's to say the longer units, such as Koheleth, Job, and the wisdom of Solomon, or Sirach. This is tractate wisdom. And these are still written in poetry, so we have to pay attention to the parallelism in its different forms. The marks of the wisdom books are easily listed. There are seven. First of all, a minimal interest in salvation history, that is the Torah and the prophets. This begins to change towards the end of the biblical period. Little interest in Israel as a nation or in its history. Thirdly, a questioning attitude to the problems of life, suffering, inequality, death. Fourthly, a search for how to master life, and understand how humans should behave before God. 
Number five, a great interest in the universal human experiences which affect all people and not just believers in Yahweh. And a very attractive feature of the wisdom books is number six, a joy in the contemplation of creation and God as creator. And number seven, there is a shift from the community as the primary emphasis to the individual who asks hard questions, as we shall see in the book of Job. The wisdom books in the Bible don't belong simply to Israel, but are part of a wider movement and search for wisdom in the ancient Near East, meaning the ancient Near East of Israel, but also Egypt. And the connection with the surrounding culture is easy enough to track. For example, the book of Proverbs is very like the story of Ahikar. The book of Job is very like a sufferer and his friend, written in Mesopotamia. Again, the book of Proverbs contains a big chunk of Egyptian wisdom, Amon M. Ope, which we saw before. And Kohileth, that very pessimistic book, is very like a suffering and a, so a sufferer and a soul. Now, the parallels can all be explored in a book called Old Testament Parallels, Laws and Stories from the Ancient Near East. And if you want to see the ones that particularly parallel the book of Job and Ecclesiastes, here's a list. The Declaration of, Innoc of Innocence, a sufferer and a soul in Egypt, a farmer and the courts in Egypt, a sufferer and a friend in Babylon, and the stories of Kirta. All these things help us to locate this wisdom search within the wider cultural phenomenon of a quest for wisdom in the ancient Near East. The book of Job overall has a relatively clear outline. There's a prologue and an epilogue. The prologue is chapters 1 to 2 and the epilogue is chapter 42 verses 7 to 16. Both of these are in prose and the rest of the book is in poetry. And there are three middle sections. Number two, the dialogue with the three friends, the longest section, chapters 3 to 31, all in poetry. Number three, the dialogue with Elihu, also in poetry, and finally, number four, the Lord speaks very powerfully in chapters 38, 1 to 42, 6. And if you ask yourself, who are the characters? Well, there's a complete list in blue over there. First of all, Job, the first seven sons and three daughters, the sons of God, God under several names, Elohim, Yahweh, El, Eloha, and Shaddai, Satan, who is not the devil, several messengers, unnumbered servants, and of course, Job's wife. The three friends are Eliphaz of Taman, Bildad of Shua, and Zophar of Namath, and there's a fourth friend appears called Elihu. Then you also have Job's brothers and sisters and friends of former times, the second seven sons and three daughters who are given lovely names, Turtle Dove, Cassia, and Mascara, and then his children's children, to the fourth generation. Now mostly it's about Job, the three friends and God. Very little is known about the production of the book of Job. The language it's written in is Hebrew, actually quite difficult Hebrew because of the poetry and because of many rare words. The author is unknown. The date is also unknown, but sometime around 600 to 300 BC. The place of writing is also unknown, but probably Israel summer because God is called Yahweh. In terms of production, the prose frames probably stand for an already available tale. Then the dialogue with the friends was inserted plus God's response. Then the book underwent further evolution. At some later stage or stages, the wisdom poem was inserted, the very beautiful chapter 28, and the dialogue with Elihu was added. In other words, the book itself is a bit of a mystery.
So now we'll move to the prologue of the book of Job. And the prologue, chapters 1 to 2, is in five very clear moments. Chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, the introduction. Chapter 1, 6 to 12, God and Satan. Chapter 1, 13 to 22, the first disaster and Job's response. Chapter 2 to 1, 7a, God and Satan. Chapter 2, 7b to 10, the second disaster, Job's wife and his response. And then chapter 2, verses 11 to 13, Job's friends gather and are silent. So we'll begin then the prologue. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions included 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys. In addition, he had a very great household, thus he was the greatest of all the people in the east. Now his sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one in turn, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. When the days of their feasting were finished, Job would send for them and sanctify them. He would get up early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job thought, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's customary practice. So verses 1 to 3 feel like the start of a folktale. Once upon a time there was a man in the land of Uz. And Job is a character in this tale, not of course a real historical figure. Uz is east of Israel somewhere. Job is described as blameless and everyone says this. Satan, God, Job and so on. He's super rich that's to say the blessing of God is on him. And then verses 4 to 6 tell us what happened regularly, what goes on usually. And we might feel that Job's caution about the potential sins of his children is just a little bit exaggerated. For the next scene, we move upstairs, so to speak. Now the day came when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also was among them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, From roving about on the earth, and from walking back and forth across it. So the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, Is it for nothing that Job fears God? Have you not made a hedge around him and his household and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his livestock have increased in the land. But extend your hand and strike everything he has and he will no doubt curse you. To your face. So the Lord said to Satan, All right then, everything he has is in your power, only do not extend your hand against the man himself. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. In this part of the writing, God is called Lord, Yahweh, the Old Testament name for God, which won't come back again until the poetry uh, in chapter 38. The word Satan simply means adversary. He is not the devil, or much less the chief devil, as in later understanding, but a regular member of the heavenly court. And Satan is cheeky and evasive. It's a bit like a teenager answering, where have you been? I was out. And the Lord boasts about Job, and Job challenges God. Why wouldn't Job be pious with all the protection? And when Satan speaks, he says, he will not out curse you to your face. And in, in Hebrew, it says literally bless. 
So this is a kind of roundabout way of saying curse. They don't like to put curse and God together. And God takes up the challenge in a way that is actually quite disturbing. Now the day came when Job's sons and daughters were eating and drinking in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job, saying, The oxen were ploughing and the donkeys were grazing beside them, and the Sabaeans swooped down and carried them all away, and they killed the servants with the sword, and I, only I alone, escaped to tell you. While this was still speaking, another messenger arrived. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and has burned up the sheep and the servants, it has consumed them, and I, only I alone, escaped to tell you. And while this one was still speaking, another messenger arrived and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands and made a raid on the camels and carried them all away, and they killed the servants with the sword, and I, only I alone, escaped to tell you. So in this scene, what usually happens is interrupted by what happened once in reality. And the repetitions in the telling show great skill. Usually in this kind of story there's a rule of three. Things happen three times. But the rule is broken in this case because there's a fourth report. And we notice already that Job says nothing. Perhaps because the telling is so breathless there seems not to be time to speak. While this one was still speaking, another messenger arrived and said, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind swept across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they died. And I, only I alone, have escaped to tell you. Then Job got up and tore his robe, he shaved his head, and then he threw himself down with his face to the ground. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return there. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. May the name of the Lord be blessed. In all this, Job did not sin, nor did he charge God with moral impropriety. So this is the fourth and most terrible disaster. And in the telling, there's no sign of any inner emotional reaction from Job. In verse 20, the formalities of mourning are observed. And verse 21 is very philosophical and at the same time quite unreal. It sounds like a formula, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return, as if a formula would answer the situation. And in verse 22 where it says, in all this Job did not sin, nor did he charge God, denial can sometimes indicate what is hidden or unspoken. So after the second attack to come, there is no mention of Job not sinning nor charging with God, which is certainly interesting. We move back upstairs in the heavenly court. And again the day came when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also arrived among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, from roving about on the earth and walking back and forth across it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on earth, a pure and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. And still he holds firmly to his integrity, so that you have stirred me up to destroy him without reason. But Satan answered the Lord, skin for skin. Indeed, a man will give up all he has to save his life. But extend your hand and strike his bone and his flesh, and he will no doubt curse you to your face. So the Lord said to Satan, all right, he is in your power, only preserve his life. So we're back in the heavenly court as before, the same cheeky answer from Satan, and God bo boasts of Job and seems to think he's been proved right. In the same breath, the Lord admits the injustice of what he has permitted. You stirred me up to destroy him without reason. Then Satan takes the discussion a step further. Material objects are one thing, even children, but attack him personally 
and we shall see. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, and he afflicted Job with a malignant ulcer from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Job took a shard of broken pottery to scrape himself while he was sitting among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Are you still holding firmly to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he replied, You are talking like one of the godless women would do. Should we receive what is good from God and not also receive what is evil? In all this, Job did not sin by what he said. So Satan inflicts a terrible disease on Job's whole body. And verse 8 is a good illustration. We're meant to think of some broken pottery scraping off the puss or something from the wounds. He's in ashes because he's in mourning for his sudden decline in health. When his wife accosts Job, she says, literally in Hebrew, bless God and die. Usually read to mean curse God and die. And there are two possible meanings. Curse God and get this over with. Or Continue to bless God and things will get worse as we saw before. And then Job reproaches his wife as one of the godless women. But then the question he asks, should we receive what is good from the God and not, not also what is evil? Sounds like the previous one, but it's a question, meaning he's beginning to suspect he should ask things. And the very last part of verse 10, in all this, Job did not sin by what he said. Is very carefully formulated. No sin in words, but certainly in thoughts. When Job's three friends heard about all this calamity that had happened to him, each of them came from his own country. Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and so far the Namathite. They met together to come to show sympathy for him and to console him. But when they gazed intently from a distance but did not recognise him, they began to weep loudly. Each of them tore his robes and they threw dust into the air over their heads. Then they sat down with him on the ground for seven days and seven nights, yet no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his pain was very great. So these are, these are the three friends who would be the dialogue partners from chapter 3 to chapter 21. They are good friends with, with, with good motives. But it says they don't recognise him. It needs to be said they don't recognise him, but they recognise that they don't recognise him, which means they really recognise him, but he's utterly changed. And their emotions come out in three ways. Firstly, they weep loudly. Secondly, they mourn. And thirdly, they are unable to speak. So the opening prologue comes to an end with the arrival of the three friends. At the start, it feels like any folktale once upon a time. And so far, it seems to be about disinterested piety picked up by Satan. And perhaps also slightly unreal piety picked up by Job's wife. Nevertheless, there's a very tricky picture, picture of God implied here, who permits things which he knows himself he should not permit. And so we're ready for chapter 3.